All right, well, it's 7 o'clock, and so in the name of being punctual, punctual, I think we'll start up. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for joining us here tonight on a rather cold, but uh, not too cold, January night um, for our community discussion that's going to broadly touch on uh, issues relating to sh the Charlie Hebdo um, attack earlier this month and some of the larger questions that come out of it. Um, tonight's discussion was organized by UND Center for Human Rights and Genocide Studies um, in conjunction with the Grand Forks Herald and we're quite thankful for them making available their community room. Um, it's a wonderful space and uh, it's great to be here. My name is Brian Erlocker. I am the co-director along with uh, Dr. Rebecca Weaver Hightower of the Center for Human Rights and Genocide Studies. Um, I will be moderating the conversation tonight, but I would point out um, that the credit for getting this event off the ground and getting the details nailed down certainly goes to um, Rebecca Weaver Hightower, also to um, Maggie O'Leary and Ashley Lushinsky um, for their help in nailing down details and getting everything lined up and in place. So thank you to them. Um, we have three guests tonight um, who will be bringing a variety of different perspectives on the um, questions of free speech and um, some of the other larger questions that around, uh, surround this. We have uh, Dr. Carrie Campbell, who is an assistant professor in history. Her work focuses on issue, issues of race and gender and imperialism in modern France. Do I have that right? Yep. Excellent. Um, we have Mossab Bajabur on the end here, um, who is a Muslim PhD student um, who focuses on post-colonial issues and utopianism. Um, and when I asked him how to introduce himself uh, or how I should introduce him, he said in a very Midwestern humble way uh, uh, that he is someone who is interested in issues of dialogue, cultural exchange, interfaith outreach that would make the world a somewhat better place, which I think is a noble ambition and we have Mike Jacobs we have Mike Jacobs who has recently retired from the Grand Forks Herald after a long and storied career where he served as both editor and publisher and so we are delighted to have all three join us here today for a conversation um, and I'd like to thank you all three ahead of time for sharing your perspectives and uh, giving of your time um, one thing I've noticed as we sort of try and orient for tonight is that the 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 events that grab headlines, the things that become the major news stories that become Charlie Hebdo or Ferguson or take on these sort of um, larger or larger than life sort of narratives tend to be not just, you know, dramatic events in their own right, but they also tend to touch on things that are sort of complex and have these sort of muddy undertones that are difficult to grapple with. Um, and I think that the Charlie Hebdo uh, attack certainly follows that pattern. And certainly the news coverage of these events is, is detailed and it is um, elaborate in terms of the who, the what, the when, the where, maybe the why, but some of the larger questions that I think propel these, these events into sort of the broader conversation um, don't always get well discussed and aren't always well explored. And if, if they are, we're oftentimes doing that on our own. And so this conversation, and I'm glad that you're all here tonight to, to join us in it, is trying to sort of have some of those larger conversations around um, um, this event, uh, the, the Charlie Hebdo attack, um, not just sort of in our own heads and sort of you know one-on-one, -on -one, but to bring together a, a very diverse set of perspectives on this that can maybe help us see some of the angles and some of the complexity. Um, and again, because it is such a, a broad topic, I'm going to take my liberty as moderator and talk for 30 seconds more um, <laughs> and try to sort of sketch out some of the things I see in terms of, of what's going on here. I mean, there's certainly this question of free speech, and I, I think this event was billed largely as a discussion of free speech, and certainly uh, the Charlie Hebdo uh, attack has been uh, linked to free speech questions, but free speech is a very complicated topic and it's, it's realized differently in different societies. Um, we all put limits around free speech in terms of yelling fire in a crowded movie theater or um, uh, different societies limit those in different ways. I lost my train of thought. Um, so we have this, the, we have different realizations, and so what free speech means in the United States and what, what it means in France may be different, how it's acted out and how it's realized. We certainly um, make sort of mental calculations about what we, what we say and when we think about how it interacts and how we actually live out and carry out um, our rights of free speech. And again, people in different societies, people in different situations make different calculations on those issues. There's also the question of violence. We hope, and I think that there's broad consensus here in this room, 
um, and, and across the larger world, that we should be able to have conversations and debate big ideas, even tense ideas, even ideas where we have fundamental disagreements and do so in a way that is civil and do so in a way that is sort of separate from violence. And yet that doesn't always happen. And so I think a, a larger question for us to maybe wrestle with and one we will not be finding answers to tonight, I'm sorry, um, is how do we as a community committed to working out our disagreements without violence um, respond when violence is deployed for political purposes, when violence is deployed in a discussion of ideas, um, and what, how can we build and strengthen uh, community norms of nonviolence and of conversation um, when we're bridging across different communities, communities that are bringing different backgrounds, different perspectives, different histories, and there's a lot of difficulty there. I have no answers for you. <laughs> this is why I'm the moderator. Um, but I, and I don't think we'll find answers tonight, but hopefully we can get that conversation started because it's a much larger um, thing than what we can handle in an hour. But if we're gonna have any chance, I need to stop talking and pass the ball down the, the line here. And so, um, Carrie, if you'd like to lead us off. Um, well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight. And I'd like to thank Becky and Brian for inviting me to talk uh, on these important issues. And I'd like to thank the Herald for, for hosting us in this uh, venue. So I thought I would talk for about um, 10 minutes uh, and bring the perspective of a historian um, to some of uh, the discussions about uh, the Paris killings and uh, some of the issues that have come about from that, uh, especially as they pertain to, uh, to free speech. Um, and uh, that's actually, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of the coverage, the media coverage of the Paris killings have been the ways in which debates around free speech have, um, been, uh, have been framed. And so what I wanted to do is just uh, start out by talking tonight with uh, some basic facts about the killings that happened in France uh, from January 7th to the 9th, 2015. So there were three killers, and they were all French citizens. Uh, they probably had others who helped them. Uh, two of them, they're the Kawachi brothers. Uh, they were the ones that attacked a satirical magazine, Charlie Hebdo. They killed 12 people there. That included a security guard and a police officer who was Muslim. There was a third killer, Amadi Koulibaly, and he's the one who attacked a Jewish supermarket and he killed four Jewish men, one of uh, whom uh, his family roots were in um, Tunisia. Koulibaly had also killed a police officer uh, who was a woman the day before. And so my point in pointing out who the killers were and who they killed is to just say that this is not necessarily an attack against white men, um, that people of different genders and uh, different uh, religions and different ethnicities were all killed during, during this attack. Also, uh, there were three targets um, that the attackers um, uh, went after. Uh, they targeted the state, they targeted the French state, uh, the police officer was a representative of the French state, of the security apparatus, so they were targeting the state. Um, they targeted Jews, and of course they targeted uh, Charlie Hebdo. Um, and so despite these facts, um, some of the debates that have been framed around the killings is that the Kalachis, uh, the Kalachi brothers and Kulabali were motiv motivated solely by ideology, um, that they were uh, motivated to attack Western values. So the argument goes that it was Islamic radicals um, who attacked a sacred tenet of Western civilization, and that sacred tenet was free speech. Um, and so the way that this debate has been framed is out of a clash of civilizations. It's the civilization of the West against this Islamic radicalism. And, um, and so, the reason that I outlined some of those facts is to just start to talk about the idea that ideology alone is not the reason uh, for the killing. So the Jews were killed at the kosher market because they were Jewish. And so this suggests uh, that anti-Semitic racism played a key role in motivating the killers. Um, as I said, the killing of the police officer was an attack against the state, not necessarily an attack against free speech. And so what I would like to suggest in uh, my remaining remarks is that uh, the issue of the Paris killings, um, it's in part about free speech, uh, but it's a type of free speech that is specific to France. 
And um, I think that this is important because it calls into question what we mean when we say that free speech is a human right. Um, is free, free speech universal? Um, does the West really value free speech? If so, to what extent? So um, the question that uh, the rest of my remarks are going to be framed around is this idea of what is freedom of speech and expression and what are its limits? So as I've already said, what constitutes freedom of speech is different in France than in the United States. And uh, in large part, the differences are based on culture and history. So again, I'm a historian, so I'm going to go into the history uh, of some of this just, just a little bit, uh, but I'll spare you the details. Um, the satirical cartoons that Charlie Hebdo uh, is famous for, and that's what they do, uh, satirical cartoons, they've, they've always been powerful in French politics, much more so than in the United States. There, there isn't a history of satirical cartoons for political use, use in the United States in the same way that there is in France. Um, and one of the most famous cases of this is uh, during the French Revolution of 1789. This was the big revolution um, that really shook, uh, shook Europe. It issued in uh, the modern age of European history. And a lot of historians will say that this was a foundational event for the formation of modern democracies. OK, so cartoons, satir uh, satirical cartoons, actually played a key role during the French Revolution in 1789. And what the cartoonists did is um, they uh, targeted the top representatives of the French state. So that was the king and the queen. And so there are all these cartoons that started to come out right as the revolution started and then um, uh, what, uh, got going. And uh, the cartoons depicted Louis XVI as a lumbering oak. Um, off, he was oftentimes depicted as being pretty heavy. And his wife, Marie Antoinette, was often depicted in erotic and even pornographic ways. Okay, so what these cartoons did is they discredited the French monarchy. Um, and in discrediting the French monarchy, they undermined, uh, they undermined the powerful authority that the king and the queen had. And so the revolutionaries, many of whom were commoners, and it was the commoners who read these satirical magazines um, and who, who were familiar with the cartoons, uh, the commoners played a key role in overthrowing the monarchy uh, during the revolution and then beheading the king and the queen in 1793. So it's a fundamental overturning of, uh, of the power structures where you have the common people rising up and overthrowing and then killing the king and the queen of France. So ever since <coughs> this time, ever since the French Revolution of 1789, French cartoonists have used the, pow the power of speech to discredit elites, the powerful, and the wealthy. And so to kind of summarize it, uh, cartoons were basically, they were, the, they were the weapon of the powerless against the powerful. However, these ideas can be twisted. And so uh, Charlie Hebdo, it uh, began in 1970, and it replaced a magazine that had actually had been banned um, because this magazine had ridiculed a uh, powerful French political leader, uh, Charles de Gaulle. Um, and so uh, Charlie Hebdo took its place. Early on, um, Charlie Hebdo was in the tradition of mocking and undermining powerful elites. However, as the magazine's popularity started to decrease, uh, Charlie Hebdo started to broaden its attacks. And so in the mid-2000s, its cartoons started to um, ridicule Islam. Um, they started to ridicule the Prophet Muhammad. And they started to ridicule Mus uh, Muslims themselves. They had a variety of cartoons. Not all of their cartoons did this. But the cartoons started to focus on Islam, Muhammad, and Muslims. Um, so by the time we get up to 2014, uh, Charlie Hebdo, on a regular basis, was using satire to ridicule people who were generally dispossessed and marginalized in French society. And so that's one of the reasons that some of its cartoons, there's just no way around it, they were racist. Um, and Charlie Hebdo. Uh, had kind of shifted. They, they no longer uh, lampooned the powerful, but they now mocked the powerless, or the, they mocked the oppressed. Okay, and so this idea of Charlie Hebdo's cartoons being racist, that raises the question of uh, the connection between racism and the marginal marginalization of Muslims in France. Uh, so as you may know from the coverage of the Paris killings, 
France has the largest Muslim population in Western Europe, and it comprises roughly between 7 and 10 percent of the French population. Uh, most of the Muslims are French citizens who have lived in France for generations, and yet they face barriers in French society that, that other citizens don't face. So just a couple of examples. Among uh, Muslim youth in France, unemployment can run as high as 40 percent. Uh, people with Muslim names have trouble finding jobs. There's a direct correlation, obviously, there with unemployment. Uh, Muslim women are not free to dress as they wish. And uh, Muslims live in communities, many of them live in communities that don't have access to full public transportation. Uh, so that obviously makes access to education and employment difficult. So a lot of this discrimination is rooted in ideas that are particular to France. Um, so this is uh, really where I want to emphasize the difference, the fundamental difference between some of the ideas that are, are powerful in France and some of the ideas that are powerful in the United States. So um, a lot of the ideas center around, <clears throat> center around the idea of uh, French secularism. So what French secularism states um, through its laws, through its constitutions, is it says that it's up to the state to protect individuals from claims of religion. It's a little bit complicated, so I'll say that again. French secularism say it says that it's the state that protects individuals from religion. So just to give you a kind of counter example to that, in the United States, religions are protected from the state. And uh, to add to that, the state is protected from religion. Okay, so there's one more piece to this. Uh, French political theory emphasizes the idea of universalism, and universalism is, of course, central to the idea of human rights as well. It's, it's central to um, different democratic forms of thought. Um, okay, so for, in France, the idea of universalism emphasizes um, that one's social, religious, and ethnic origins are actually irrelevant. So everybody is French, and thus everybody is the same. Uh, famously, the French government doesn't keep statistics on people's racial religious backgrounds, which again, it's very different than the United States. You know, the U.S. census, you fill out those types of things, but the French say, no, 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 we don't need to do that because everybody's French. Okay, so one of the best examples of this idea of French secularism and universalism uh, was a, a famous um, ban in 2004. This is a, a law that was passed by, um, uh, by the uh, French government. And what the ban entailed um, is it said that the, the wearing of conspicuous signs of religious affiliation would make, be made illegal in public schools. So the state claimed that everybody needed to be secular and not French. If you went to a public school, you needed to abandon any part of your particular background when it came to religion. So Catholics couldn't wear big crosses. And Jews couldn't wear anything that was particular to being Jewish. And uh, most importantly for what we're talking about here, uh, Muslim girls couldn't wear headscarves. Um, so this is what caused uh, a huge debate because what ended up happening was in practice, the law resulted in banning Muslim girls from wearing headscarves at rate, rates that were much more disproportionate in comparison to uh, Catholics and to, uh, to Jews. Many French people protested this law, uh, including many Muslims. Uh, one of the most famous, uh, her name is uh, Saida Kata, and she was the founder of a group called French uh, Muslim Women in Action. Uh, when she was protesting this headscarf ban from 2004, she argued, she said that women don't don the veil because the Quran requires it, but because it reflects an individual's spiritual relationships. Uh, so I'll quote her to, to say what she, what she said. So this is how she put it. She said, uh, one is a Muslim first, one adheres to a certain philosophy of life, and in this context, one wants to wear the headscarf. On the other hand, French proponents of the 2004 law that effectively banned headscarves, the, uh, the proponents tended to portray uh, women as victims of their families or dupes of what they called radical Islam. Um, and uh, so, when, uh, and so Kata herself, when she was saying that women, there, there are some women who want to wear the veil, she was saying that that should be protected under French law because that's freedom of expression. 
So you can see how these debates are kind of coming to a head here. Um, the headscarf ban had uh, full-ranging effects, and one of the things that it did is it, it stigmatized adult women from wearing the headscarf. This, in turn, uh, played a role in stigmatizing uh, Muslims in general. Um, I should say that there were also Muslim groups in France. Um, one of the most famous is a feminist group called um, Neither, uh, Neither Whores or Submissives, and they supported the ban, and they circulated petitions uh, in support of the ban. Of the ban. So um, Muslim, the Muslim community was just as divided as um, uh, other communities with regards to the ban. Okay, so um, for its part, uh, Charlie Hebdo, you could probably imagine where it came down on the ban. Um, it ridiculed Muslim women who wanted to wear the headscarf. So going to this question of what is freedom of speech and what are its limits, in France, French Muslims don't have access to the same degree of freedom of speech and expression as secular French. Um, so I'll just uh, make a few concluding remarks. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the far right is gaining uh, a great deal of power in, uh, across Europe uh, right now. Arguably the most influential of the far right uh, groups and politicians uh, is a, a French group. It's called, it's a French political party, it's called the National Front. And its leader uh, is a woman by the name of Marine Le Pen. Um, and Europe was kind of rocked last summer because uh, in elections to the EU Parliament, it was the National Front that got the largest amount of votes um, in France. More than the socialists, more than the center-right. So this said a lot about French politics. And um, consequently, Marine Le Pen is getting a lot of um, coverage in her ideas. And just 10 days ago, she wrote an editorial in the New York Times. Some of you may have, have read it and may have seen it. And in this editorial for the New York Times, she cast herself Again, she's a far-right politician. It's a, the, the National Front is an anti-immigrant um, party. They went out of the EU. And um, in this editorial, Marine Le Pen championed herself as a, a human rights activist um, and free speech activist. And so this is what she said in, um, uh, in her editorial. She said, France, the land of human rights and freedoms was attacked on its own soil by a totalitarian ideology, Islamic fundamentalism. And then the rest of the editorial, of course, expanded upon this idea. Um, and so what I would like to uh, leave us with is um, <clears throat> the idea that if human rights are really going to mean something, uh, supporters need to reject the idea of the clash of civilizations of you know, France of freedom and human rights versus totalitarian ideology of Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, human rights supporters seem to reject, reject the idea of a class of clash of civilizations that was used, that, that Le Pen used, um, and instead combat sources of more subtle discrimination that are just as prominent in France and the United States as anywhere else. So I'll, I'll stop there. See, I think there is no difference. Uh, we are immigrants in Switzerland, and when we uh, when we were deciding, my parents were deciding whether to stay in Europe or, or to come um, to America. It was it was the knowledge that in America everybody's an American. It was exactly the opposite of what you just said. In France, you would, they said you will never be accepted as a French person. So I think. If this is reversed, I think it has nothing to do with uh, your citizenship of, of being in that country. It has to do with your social class, your uh, your uh, your poverty. Poor people are, are persecuted, and the Arabs in particular have been victimized. The French were very kind to accept uh, they're very open to the Arab culture, and there's very a lot of Arabs who've done very well, and there are a lot of Arabs who, who remain poor and, and somehow don't get off it, you know. And but that's everywhere, you know. There are a lot of Americans in the same boat: immigrants who do well and immigrants who do less well. So I don't think you can really say that the French, if in France you're 
definitely a French person, more than you could say an American is really an American. Yeah, I think I'd like to respond, but I think that yeah, I, I, I would. I think there's a way to square this circle, and I think you're actually sort of talking a similar kind of thing. But maybe we can pull that in in, in, a, in a larger conversation at the end. Is that? Yeah, I think I think there's space for that definitely. So we've got at least two themes we're pulling in. Um, if we work down, Mike, would you like to take a crack at? Well, first let me say, I'm not grateful for being invited. <laughs> uh, this, this is a, a very, very difficult subject. Uh, I assume that I was invited because we need a free speech absolutist in the conversation. And so I will assume that role. I do believe that freedom of speech is the sine qua non of free society. Without freedom of speech, you have no basis for a liberal civilization. Uh, blasphemy is not a crime. Blasphemy is a sin. Uh, it is a sin in a specific religious context, so that a Christian would blaspheme in a way that a Muslim or a Jew or a member of any other uh, religious tradition could not blaspheme. And so you cannot, in a free society, make blasphemy a civil crime. Uh, so those are the two absolutist points of view that I would express. Having said that, I would quickly say that in the media, we ought not do things simply because we can. Uh, we ought not, we not, ought not cause gratuitous uh, offense. Uh, now, I, I don't read French. Uh, I certainly am not, uh, uh, other, than the, other than the broad, uh, the broad strokes that you learn in, uh, in Gordon Eisminger's European history class, uh, I'm really not familiar uh, to any degree uh, with, with, French, with French history. Um, I do know that, and I think this is important, because in, 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 in trying out my arguments on a friend the other day, she said, uh, so that means that there is, a, there is an absolute uh, presumption of freedom of the press across, across societies. And of course, we know that that's not true. The Canadians, actually, have a quite a different notion about uh, freedom of speech than we do, uh, and, a, and, a, and a really quite radically different notion about how the press should operate than we do in the United States. And in general, the United States is by far the most uh, resistant to restrictions on, on uh, freedom of, of speech or freedom of the press. Um, the other thing that, that uh, so, so and, and of course, this question about, about uh, religious garb is a, is, a, is a living issue in Quebec. Uh, and, uh, and the question of hate speech, hate speech is not legal in Canada. There are things that you cannot say without, without facing prosecution. And, and prosecution is, it's not frequent, but it does occur, and it has, it has occurred in places like Saskatchewan. Uh, so uh, you know, it is a different presumption that the Canadians have than, than that we do. And I respect the Canadian presumption while I continue to believe that the American presumption is, is the better one, uh, that, that, uh, that it is precisely freedom of speech that makes it possible for us to reach the kind of accommodations that are necessary to share the planet. 
Uh, and without freedom of speech, uh, you, you, you find yourself not being able to make, uh, to make arguments, whether intelligent ones or not, that, that further the, the ability to build a civil society that all of us can, can feel that we are a part of and that legitimately responds to our, uh, to our, uh, our wishes. Uh, so having said all of that, uh, you know, it, it is vastly more complicated than that because, because each, of the, each of the religious uh, points of view as they exist in 21st century, uh, in the 21st century, which is a Christian concept, of course, um, uh, have, have their own um, have their own focus on on um, on history and on on uh, how things came to be. I was I was brought up short. I was raised Catholic uh, in a German-speaking home. Um, I was brought up short uh, by a friend of mine pointing out to me that the incarnation is the single most important thing that has happened in human history. Well, you know, I come from a Catholic home and nobody ever taught me that. Uh, but that, that is a point of view which is actively uh, advanced by modern Catholic uh, thinkers. Uh, the speaker uh, who made this assertion is the president of, the, of uh, the largest Catholic institution in the state, uh, the University of Mary. Uh, so that, that, was a, that was a surprise to me. Now, I can imagine uh, that he might think that my uh, skepticism about that statement, even perhaps my rejection of the statement, might be an act of blasphemy. But I would be, I would be uh, shocked if there, were, that if there were some sense that I ought to be punished for having that point of view. Uh, so the point I'm, the point I'm trying to, to put across here is that we can't, we can't allow ourselves to get into the situation where, where a religious assertion is unchallengeable, uh, that it is blasphemy on its face, and that that should be illegal speech. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting, and, and I will just mention this because uh, I happen to be interested in uh, a Christian movement called Arianism, which arose in the fourth century. Uh, basically, the Arians denied the divinity of, or the dual nature of Christ. Um, and not long afterwards, one of the really great divisive issues in Christian history arose uh, the question of whether or not it was blasphemous to create graven images. Uh, this is the great uh, iconographic dispute that arose in the Eastern Church. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the solution that was reached after centuries, a couple of centuries at least, of argument, was that in fact, representations of the divine were an appropriate aid, aid to worship. Uh, the, the, uh, the Muslim point of view, as I understand it, uh, is quite different. That, that it is forbidden to make a representation of the prophet. And in fact, uh, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken, uh, Muslim places of worship are not decorated with realistic representations of, 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 uh, of people and are, and are, and are, are, are more uh, design and you know, sort of complicated tracery and the, and the like uh, as, a, as a way to represent the divine than the way that Christians do with the halos and the smiles and the, you know, the, the babies and, you know, and so on and so forth. So, so, but this issue arose in, in, in Christian history. So uh, my bottom line is I am in fact a free speech absolutist. Uh, I, I do not recognize the possibility of blasphemy being a civil crime. It would amount to an establishment of religion. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I am fully aware and deeply cognizant of how extremely fraught this issue is. Oh. <laughs>
All right, so we have uh, a, a complicated view, an absolutist view, and Masab, would you add a, a third perspective? Okay, well, um, well um, so greetings, and um, I was gonna say thank you for having me, but just now I just like thought, what have I got myself into? <laughs> So, um, but I'm just going to read what I have, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, more discussion will uh, you know generate as we go on. And um, and so, in this brief discussion, I would like to bring up um, four issues, and more as the discussion goes on. Uh, two issues are related to Muslims and uh, their reaction, and two to the Western notion of free speech and uh, media reaction. So, the first issue is regarding the uh, terrorist attack. Uh, no person, you know, in their uh, right frame of mind, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, would accept that uh, the notion of killing others for speaking up their minds. Um, and in Islam, terrorism, in all its forms, um, is uh, condemned and it's punished, and usually the punishment for it is uh, a capital punishment. Um, in the Quran, you know, uh, life is sacred, and um, um, there's this famous verse of uh, nurturing one life is like nurturing all, and uh, destroying one is like destroying all. And um, in addition to this, if one uh, were to read the Quran, um, you know, he or she would find out that probably one third of it is about defending faith through reasoning, through speech and dialogue, and not through uh, coercion. Uh, and there are explicit, explicit verses against it using force and coercion. An idea is fought back with an idea, a thought with a thought, and we are always reminded that the final judge is God and not us. Now, when it comes to the cartoons, uh, the Muslims were the Muslim world rose up and many Imams and Muslim scholars urged people to defend the Prophet. But by this they meant through speeches, you know, peaceful protests, protests through uh, lawsuits, boycotts, etc. And not through killing or rioting. Um, as a matter of fact, some scholars even prohibited protesting, fearing the blown out of proportions uh, consequences. So this is something that I thought of laying out, laying to rest. Uh, the ter terrorist attacks that were carried out were just that, um, terrorist attacks and they should be treated as such. Now, the second issue um, I would like to bring up is in relation to the reaction or overreaction of uh, Muslims uh, over the matter. There are th certain things we need to keep up, to keep in mind here. Um, and it is unfortunate that um, the all too readily answer that is presented as to why Muslims are angry is blasphemy. Uh, depiction of the Prophet is blasphemous, and the uh, French, you know, some people would argue that the French had the right to blaspheme, and that Muslims should get over it. Um, I think the issue is way more complicated than this uh, ready uh, reasoning, because a lot of Muslim, you know, we see in a lot of Muslim literature um, that has depictions of the Prophet, and there are Muslims who have been more blasphemous, but, you know, uh, pretty much got away with it. Uh, that's not the issue, uh, I think. Um, to many Muslims, I think that the depiction of the Prophet is just the tip of an iceberg of a long history of, you know, what they consider as a Western assault. Um, in the world in general, and Muslims in specific. Um, the reasoning among many Muslims is that they attack us, they kill us, you know, since colonization, they destroy our country, support puppet dictators, rob us of our land, natural sources, then add insult to injury by depicting our prophet as a terrorist. But then here's something I think many Muslims unfortunately fail to understand. The West is not one thing. People in the West are not the same. And a Danish dairy company, for example, or Coca-Cola, uh, shouldn't be boycotted and attacked for what some media outlets say, especially some lousy media outlets that only survive on you know, uh, provoking others and um, throwing out insults. The other issue that many Muslims also fail to keep in mind is the example of the reaction of the Prophet when insulted. Insulting Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not something new. During his life, he was called a sorcerer, a deviant, mentally ill, destroyer of harmony and family values, etc. He was laughed upon, insulted, physically and verbally harassed, and eventually an attempt on his life forced him to flee his hometown. The question I always ask my fellow Muslims when this comes up is, what did the Prophet, after this 23 years or so of assaults in all forms, do? Well, the answer is, um, tué pardon, right? Uh, which is, ironically, the post-attack of Charlie Hebdo's edition, All is Forgiven. And I'm serious, this is exactly what the Prophet said to the people of Mecca after 23 years of torture. And this is how he won the hearts of the Arabs in Arabia as a whole. And if time would permit, I can quote a dozen or more of verses from the Quran and from the Prophet's tradition that explicitly instruct the Prophet and the believers not to engage with people whose purpose is to uh, trash others or provoke 
anger, and rather engage in meaningful argumentation and dialogue. But then the voice of reason is usually lost in the hype and the havoc. Um, the third issue I want to bring up is regarding the notion of free speech. I think you know, uh, this notion is a purely Western one, and I don't think a lot of cultures uh, believe in absolute free speech the way Western cultures think they do. As a matter of fact, in many cultures, whether one, uh, whatever one utters has consequences. So we read in a lot of wisdom poetry and fables from oral tradition in Middle East, China, Persia, Africa, etc., that the piece of muscle in your mouth can either save you or destroy you. Uh, speaking responsibly, respectfully, and wisely is a sign of civility that children are taught from an early age. So to many people around the world, insulting the sacred or poking fun at serious things is not funny, and it is not considered an indication of human civil progression. Um, the evolution of the idea of free speech in the West, of course, is understandable uh, because there is history behind it, as you, know, um, you explained. Uh, but this history is unfortunately not shared by many other cultures, and therefore, Many other, you know, it doesn't really click uh, in many other cultures, um, you know, uh, psyche. But then I also want to push this further and argue that even in the West, free speech is not absolute, and certainly not in France. You know, take for example the crackdown on anti-Semitism rhetoric. In France, there are laws that criminalize people who reject crimes against humanity, excluding the ones done by France, of course, uh, but are arrested and charged for making fun of Jews on numerous occasions, including the cartoonist sign in Charles Hebdo itself who was fired for saying that he'd rather cut his balls off than apologize for a cartoon deemed insensitive, insensitive for Judaism. Uh, and nowadays, Holland is even um, pushing these laws further to include whoever opposes you know, the policies of Israel and um, eliminating the distinction between policies of a country and their religion. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here as pushing for uh, uh, or allowing anti-Semitism rhetoric to flourish, because I do think that stereotypes, typing people, does invoke hatred and cause harm. What I'm trying to say is that we have an issue of double standard. We rightly ban anti-Semitism rhetoric because it incites hatred and has dire consequences, yet we fail to do so, the or we fail to do the same when it comes to other groups, specifically Muslims. After all, the Muslim minority in France have a history of being stigmatized, discriminated against, poorly misrepresented, and when I visited France, I never really thought that the city of light would house ghettos in every sense of the word. After the Charlie Hebdo's attack in the course of one week, there were 144 reported hate crimes against Muslims, mosques were sabotaged, swastikas and hate uh, statements were sprayed around properties, women were attacked, one was raped, and one pregnant woman uh, had a miscarriage, yet the flag of free speech you know, was uh, flying in front of the, you know, in front of the face uh, of these people. Hence, to many Muslims, this type of free speech might sound hypocritical, um, and um, you know, a state that can institute and, and, and execute laws that criminalize the offense of one abused minority can surely extend these laws to include other abused minorities as well. The final issue that I would like to bring up here is regarding the notion of apology. So should Muslims apologize for this? Um, in an interview with a Muslim fellow, I uh, forgot his name, uh, Sean Hannity, um, the all wise and confident, Asked his Muslim guest, why aren't Muslims denouncing this? Why are they mute when, they, when it comes to terrorist attack? Doesn't this imply that they agree with what is going on? Um, the guest took a deep breath and they responded that, well, Sean, we have screamed our lungs out denouncing this, but nobody listens. No one gives us the podium to say this, and if you give me the podium, I will even scream more. Of course, you know, Sean, in his infinite wisdom, humped this untrue, uh, humped this, unsure whether he or his viewers should consent to his guest's argument. Well, I think the guest is right. The media does not give podium to reasonable or common folks because it is not the function of media to represent fair and balanced stuff. Fair and balanced is dumb and dull. A media outlet would rather, would rather ride on sensations, thrillers, scandals, and propaganda because that's what brings viewers and bucks. But then my instant response to what the guest said while watching Jon Stewart's coverage of this is, why screaming your lungs, my friend? I mean, take it easy and save your lungs for heavy breathing on things that are more important, like admiring triple chocolate fudge brownies or making babies or better than sex cupcakes. Um, would Sean or a priest in a church or a president of a cultural institute or any common folk in the street apologize for crimes in the name of Christianity or France or America? 
After all, you know, especially in America, you know, we Americans hold a world record of the amount of people we killed single-handed. Nobody beats us, not the Mongolians, or the Huns, or the Vikings, or even Sauron from Middle Earth himself. Chances are is that no one will apologize for things done under the banner of his or her goodwill or country or religion or morals or principles. As a matter of fact, many would probably double down and try to add meaning and high moral ground for what happened. Um, and I want you to think of the American sniper as an example of this. My point here is that one does not need to apologize for a crime he or she did not do. If asked, I would voice my condemnation and abhorrence of, and work with authorities to battle this but I wouldn't go out of my way and certainly will not hurt my precious lungs for it. So anyway, um, these are four issues I thought I would bring up and um, hopefully as the discussion moves on, we could um, talk about them. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. I don't want to, uh well, I, yes I do. I want to uh, quick try and take my role as the moderator and try and highlight a couple sort of larger themes that, that cross the three um, uh, presentations, and that'll maybe kick us off for a, a larger discussion. Um, something that I, I think came through in, in all three presentations is that um, the Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoons that seem to be at the, the heart of this whole, uh, if you can call it a, a massacre, a kerfuffle, um, or perhaps in poor taste. And I, I don't know the comedian offhand who pointed this out, but uh, a big part of comedy is punching up and not punching down. Um, and when you're punching up, you are in the tradition of France of challenging the monarchy. When you're punching down, it's just a little mean-spirited. And so we could perhaps um, you know, have, a, have a separate conversation from free speech in terms of whether or not that is wise or prudent or funny. A second theme that seems to come across is that when we talk about free speech, we're talking about something we, we, we hold to and we care about, but something that in practice, in life, has a lot of complexity and different societies and different communities have embraced it differently, have interpreted it differently, and, and, and look upon it differently. And so I think there's a lot of space there. Um, and then a third thing is um, the complexity of communities. And I think uh, Mossab and, and Kerry both spoke to this in terms of um, you know, being held accountable to your larger community and, and in Carrie's discussion about the idea of clash of civilizations, that we're thinking about this in terms of not individuals and their individual reaction, but we're thinking about this in terms of larger societies and how we're just incompatible and, and how that can sort of trap us all in, in, a, in a conversation that, that spins its wheels, right? And maybe we end up wasting our breath. Do that, I, th I think that, that ties a number of different things together, but I don't want to you know, tell you what I think, but... I think, I think we should just stipulate that the cartoons are disgusting. You know, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's, there's no real, there's no real uh, redeeming uh, quality artistically or even, I think, in political dialogue. That does not take away, however, from the fact that they are within their right to publish them. You know, there's, nothing in, there's nothing in the concept of freedom of speech that says it has to be nice. Uh, and one of the arguments that I would make about, about the United States at least is that it is, it is precisely the stigmatization of racist and hateful speech uh, through the, the public dialogue that has, that has removed certain phrases from our language that were in everyday use in every community in the land within my lifetime. And you know that you know so so that kind of speech was stigmatized. Thank you. I agree with you, Mike. I heard my father-in-law say things that even my father wouldn't say. But anyway, uh, the. Number The first thing I specifically wanted to mention was when you said uh, about uh, the, the first thing about um, not uh, the first item you had about not uh, not speaking about problems was, I mean, you said this, and then they, 
the people on either side of you suddenly bent over and started writing. But the, uh, the second thing I am interested in is, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Yes, you. Uh, but uh, you are the one who knows about the French. And as soon as I saw the name Boumedien, all I could think of was the uh, uh, the the oh jeez, I'm sorry. I you know I'm still recovering from surgery and I don't remember things well. Um, but the Algerian War. Uh, Boumedienne rang a bell big time, and is she related to um, the the guy who was? But well, that I, I I don't know I don't know, but um, I think it is useful to to make a passing reference to the Algerian Revolution, and so so the revolution yeah. that the Algerians. Um, it's a war of independence that took place from 1954 to 1962, where Algeria broke away from France, and that's yeah, the source of the. She might have been like the but, granddaughter. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the personal connections on that one. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Okay, I have a couple of things to say. First, um, first things, is that um, when it comes to religion. I think we have to find the common thread. There will always be extremism if we don't find what's common among all faith. And uh, the second thing, if France is 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 capt uh, is capti uh, is captivating the, the and and moving into conservatism. It means that liberalism has not obviously worked. It's, it's causing a lot of, of, of division. And to move into conservatism means maybe more order. And um, you know what, one thing that I'll say to that is that um, the fight for rights is always a fight. And so if you look at French history, they're on their, their fifth republic. The previous republics were overthrown in one way or another by um, emperors or dictators or fascists. And so every single time, the people who were believing in democracy, they had to come in and fight back for it. So it's not a matter, I don't think, of um, liberalism failing. I think that it's under constant, it's always being challenged. And so for people who believe in things like rights and freedoms, they always have to continually fight for those things because there are always going to be these forces that are pushing back against it. So this business of the rise of the far right right now, it, 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 and it is being confronted by a lot of people trying to push back against, in France, the national. Well, all through Europe now, when you hear Norway and the way he had to be a serial killer to, to show that he, he, you know, Norway cannot, uh, uh, cannot accept uh, you know, the fundamentalist rights of Muslims to disturb the whole society. You know, it, it, it took an insane person to, to make some sense. You know, if Muslims don't want to live civilly, they're never going to be accepted. You know, they have to, they have to live civilly and, 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 and live a, with, with a culture that accepts them um, as freedom to worship as a care to um, seeing a common thread because people assimilate into a culture. They, before Obama was uh, elected, there was something going on through the internet. Can, can an American be a Muslim? Can, and then they had, they listed 10 reasons why an American president could not be a Muslim. I don't think Obama has taken a full stand on being a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. He's mm -hmm. not a Muslim. I, I have not seen, uh, you know, this is what the thing was going around. They were saying, can a Muslim be president? Uh, now, 
the, another thing is, is the Judeo-Christian tradition is, is so, so particular to America. I am surprised at you, Mr. Jacobs, that you don't, didn't understand that the incarnation was a fulfillment of the Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, the birth of Jesus is... is I, it's not that I don't understand it, it's that I don't accept it. That is, yeah, I think there's a question back there. I think somebody else has a question. Yeah. I'm going to stand right now. Um, I'm not okay with anything that you just said. We have a man that is standing before us right now, and he's obviously a part of that religious group, and he is, and I, like, I'm going to break down right now. Like, how can you sit there and give that kind of ignorant opinion about your religious views and his religion and talk so horribly about somebody like that? No, you do not know anything about the religion. You have no clue. And I'm not going to be kind about it. Yes, you have no clue what their beliefs are. No, they are a very peaceful world. You, well, the way that you were talking about it is not respectful at all. None. Yeah. But that's what you're doing right now. That you are that is what you're doing right now though. Okay, my I can I I'm just going to give my point now. I want to say that your religion should not have to apologize for the things that you like that the extremists do. Um and I think that was that was Masab's point was that, that Yeah, no, no, and that's what I'm saying. Um we have our issues in our country. Um, we have extremists in our country. They do terrible things. We're not expected to apologize for it. And I'm sorry, I'm breaking down and crying. No, but I mean, you don't you don't have to apologize for the KKK team. No, I know exactly, <laughs> and that's my point. We understand that um, they're, and, and that was Masab's point, I think. And I think there's. She's. I mean. I think we're going to move on because there were a lot of really good issues that were brought up. And this lady's had her hand up here for a while. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that we are all guilty of really lazy thinking in lumping different things into, you know, all of a group and saying they all think like this. There are many, many Muslims in many different countries and they don't all share the same belief, and they don't all share the same agenda, and they don't all have the same, uh, you know, they're not all working together to, to bring down the West. And the West isn't all one thing. It isn't all one thing set on, on you know, subjugating all the rest of the world. You know, we're all guilty of this kind of broad, lazy thinking in going, you know, whether it's against religion or politicians or the Democrats or the Republicans, we tend to just, instead of looking at the complexities and, and, and trying to understand each other and listen to each other, we just go, ah, you're all like that. Thank you very much. The pass back here, and then we'll get to the back of the board. I can, I'll, I, can, I can talk really loud, so it's fine. Um, I just wanted to say you said that there was three groups that were targeted you know, in, in the attacks. But I also wanted to say that one group that people don't realize that was targeted is Islam, Muslims. Because you know, when you come down to it, what happened was, in the end, what was, what was highlighted from this attack? That these were Muslim extremists. And on top of that, the other thing was that before, who knew about Charlie Abdo? This is one thing that really bothers me, is that we in this society didn't really know about Charlie Hebdo, but now it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the world. And the message that they were trying to stifle is now spread everywhere. So one thing is that Islam was attacked in this as well. And I just wanted to highlight that for everybody to realize. Thank you. Did you guys want to in my comment as we're moving? Yes, I was wondering. You say the far right is uh, is um, gaining uh, gaining steam over there. Is that uh, 
Is that the Nazis? Uh, are they are they in that group? No, no, the no, the neo Nazis aren't necessarily. They're, they're not in the far right. Right, the, rise the far right. No. If the far right took uh, gained power, would uh, what would the results be for the minorities? Well, in France, I think there'd be very strong restrictions against um, immigration um, and immigrants. Uh, you start to see uh, efforts to pass laws against um, naming um, uh, Muslim family families naming um, their children with Muslim names. Uh, I think you'd see the state trying to pass laws restrict. Um, uh, restricting Muslim access to um, uh, certain customs when it comes to food. Um, and so all of those things would stigmatize um, uh, Muslims, and a lot of it is framed as anti-immigrant. Um, so if, if the national front were to come to power, you'd start to see that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for standing up for uh, faith. And uh, thank you for expressing your opinion. We are, of course, here for freedom of speech and talking about that and it's really important that we express our opinion and what's inside us and uh, and uh, when I look at myself I see myself that I have lived civilized uh, and many Muslims like uh, one of uh, the Muslims I know sitting over there he has lived civilized uh, uh, there's another Muslim woman she is also civilized so but my my question is as a person who has lived in France, and uh, I got my, my master's degree in France, and I have also, I, I always had this question, why uh, uh, French, uh, French technically, they have been the flag, uh, 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 they always had the flag of freedom of speech in their hand, but they have been always selective towards uh, 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 freedom of speech. One of the uh, main big examples is uh, Roger Gardy when he uh, uh, published a book about uh, like Holocaust and stuff. And, uh, uh, and uh, in his book, he says that I published the, this and he never used the word Jew in the book. And he says that uh, I published this because I wanted to say that Israeli government cannot uh, justify what they are doing to Palestinians uh, based on what happened in the past. This person, this guy was sentenced to jail and, uh, on, uh, and I think it was February 1998, he had to also uh, pay $20,000 at that time as a fine and the book was banned forever. So how we can justify this? Why French government or French society has always been selective towards? There are also other examples have been selective towards stuff. Um, one of the things that, so in my talk, I came down kind of hard against the French for limiting freedom of speech and Muslim, uh, expression among Muslim communities. But one of the things that's interesting about France and other democracies is uh, when you look at the French Constitution um, and the different types of constitutions they've had over the past, you know, over 200 years, um, uh, the statutes in the Constitution that talk about freedom of speech they always have some type of limitations on it, and I can't remember. I can't. I can't quote the exact language, but um, to paraphrase, they basically say um, everyone has the freedom of speech so long as it doesn't um, uh, adversely affect a great number of people. And so there, there is a limit to the complete freedom that an individual has, um, and it's it's the idea that the French are trying to find a balance between. Um, individual rights and acknowledging that we all live in a community, we all need to get along. Get along. Um, and if everybody is completely free to do whatever they want all of the time, um, you're going to have too much chaos. And so that's a balance that, again, is particular to France. And I think the French are trying to strike. I think we have a, maybe stronger protections of the individual in the United States than the French do. But again, that's specific to the to their history, trying to break away from some of the pr privileges of you know, the time of monarchy. Um, so there's a limit to freedom of speech. Yeah. The government. Well, but there really isn't a practical limit to freedom of speech in the United States. A practical legal limit. Uh, I mean, you, you, can, you can say whatever you like. Uh, the only limit on, on speech really is truth. 
you know, you, you're not free in the United States to, to libel someone. Uh, but, uh, you know, it would be very difficult. It would be very difficult. It is very difficult to prove libel, and it would be very difficult to prove libel against a group. Um, so I think that the United States has about as close to an absolutist notion about freedom of speech as it would be possible to have without chaos. And, you know, I mean, you, you, this, this was quoted earlier, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, unless it happens to be true, you know, in which case you have a responsibility to shout fire. So, you know, it's, 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 but other countries have, you know, yeah, even, even, you know, the country that we, we all think that Canada is another state, but, you know, they have a, they have a very, very different notion about this. America, yeah, I'd, I'd like to direct this question to the professor. Uh, you, you mentioned that France, um, you know, they don't keep racial statistics or things like that, the exact opposite of the United States. So. Here we have two countries dealing with diversity in exact opposite ways. France, everybody's French. We're not even going to keep statistics. Uh, it seems like they've embraced the melting pot. <laughs> that was the U.S. A policy, you know, a century ago, while the United States has embraced diversity uh, or multiculturalism. So what, uh, I mean, apparently both have problems. So. Could you uh, comment on those two different approaches? Um, I think I think that to to understand French views of uh, freedom of speech and expression and, and those types of things, um, you have to understand uh, that so much of French history, the Catholic Church was very very powerful um, and was much more of a political force than um, uh, you know than a force for. You know, looking after people's faith. And so for the French to promote the idea of individual rights, they had to break away from the Catholic Church. And so for, for the French to promote democracy, they had to have a really, really strong sense of secularism. Um, and in the United States, we never had that powerful Catholic Church that we had to break away from. Um, and so the history of religion in France is, is, again, it's very different, and I think that that's why you see a really, really, really strong sense of secularism in France. But, but, but the broader yeah. approach to this diversity, what, whether it's, I mean, is it France? I mean, they don't want to wear the head scarf, so they want, you know, that's what they're trying to force assimilation, apparently, it seems like, um, while the you know, United States, you know, but that, but that's that's actually a modern notion in the United States. I mean, go back and read some of Theodore Roosevelt's talks. Oh, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. The, the, you know, traditionally, America was the melting pot. Now we're, we're but, in the. But it was a melting. It was a melting pot without any spice. Yeah. You know, without any spice. You, 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 got, you, you got assimilated if you were German or Norwegian or Italian or what, you know, well, not even so much Italian. You know, it was, it, was, it was a particular kind of person who was Americanized. And you know, I think what we're seeing now is, is sort of the redefinition of, of what it means to be an American that is much more inclusive than, than even the great heroes of, of our no, you know, but uh, Theodore Roosevelt died in what, 1920, 22? You know, less than 100 years ago. Well, I think another dimension that with, with how Fran France has wrestled with identity has to do with the empire. And that when France had a large global empire, the idea that we are all French was very important in terms of sustaining the empire. But if you don't have an empire, then starting to rethink about what makes you French is a little bit different than you are part of the empire, even if you have a different religion or cultural background. Um, and so I think France is, is in the middle of trying to figure out what they mean when they say we are French. Yeah. Well, I, that's not technically what I said, but... <laughs>
think about America in terms of the world, we're also very individualistic. We like to think of ourselves as every single person here is special and their own person and gets to be who they are. So when we start thinking about um, race or religion, these are things that make us up our identities. These are who we are. So I think about um, a comment earlier about how, you know, you're going to school, you're a part of the school. I can't imagine going to school and being stripped of my identity at that school. I can't imagine going to work and being stripped of my identity at work, you know, and if religion is a part of my identity, then that's, I mean, that's a big deal, right? And these headscarves, it's not like a fashion thing. It's, this is your identity. This is who you are. So being stripped of that, that's, you're not a person anymore, you know? Um, that's a really big deal. Uh, I also think about, uh, Mossab mentioned about how freedom of speech is very different in other cultures in America. We like to think that we can all be ourselves and say what we want to say. And in other cultures, you're going against your, na your nation or your people or your family. Um, and that in itself is a big deal. Whereas here, you know, we're like, we can do that. We're individuals. So it's important to keep that in mind that as Americans, we are very, we're all cowboys, you know, it's just, it's a really different mindset. So I think that it kind of changes how we think about identity when you think about American identity and then other kinds of identities around the world. That's just what I wanted to add. Uh, no, I agree with, uh, with this. I mean, um, like what I'm trying to say is that sometimes freedom of speech has different understandings in different places. Um, and sometimes it just simply doesn't click um, to some people. Um, it doesn't make any sense. So we need to keep that in mind when we talk about different uh, things. I mean, the same thing would happen for a lot of Americans when they hear some things that they would think exotic or bizarre and uh, it just doesn't click to us. And so, you know, you know, understanding and being aware of differences is, you know, helps a lot in, in you know, understanding the whole situation. But, but again, yeah. but again, one of the things that, that has helped us to be identifiable as individuals is the very strongly held and elegantly articulated notion that we get to say and think what we want. And you know, that's, that's after all, what the, what the founding documents are about. Uh, and so it's, you know, that sense of identity is, is a product of, of, the, of the sort of collective decision that was made uh, at the founding of the, of the country. And these, as, I, as I started out, you know, the single most important part of that is freedom of speech. And I would also like to add to this is that, um, I, you know, I, I go into a lot of discussions with my Muslim friends and try to explain things. And one of the things that I say is that freedom of speech has a history um, and background that has developed and evolved um, in four centuries or three centuries. So we need to understand you know that you know people have different notions of what to say and what not to say and we shouldn't really hold everyone accountable uh, the way we hold ourselves i mean we need to understand that there are differences and uh, we just need to accept that really so i think that the herald must have turned on the heat <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're over our time limit so it's a subtle cue <laughs>